computer science or RCIS. Okay, on to the good stuff, black holes. Um, I'm pleased to turn the podium over today to our moderator. His name is De Dr. Jesse Rogerson, and Jesse actually came all the way over from Ottawa to be here. Um, he works at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum, but really he's no stranger to Toronto. Um, he's worked at uh, York University. He did a lot of excellent astronomy outreach there. He worked at the Ontario Science Centre when I was there with him as well, working there. Uh, he's a really passionate science communicator. He likes to really use the museum as a platform to engage the public and encourage science literacy. And uh, actually, interestingly enough, when Jesse and I were both at the Science Centre, we, we took turns uh, taking on the position of the resident astronomy expert. And I think the main difference between him and me is that Jesse holds uh, an observational uh, PhD in astrophysics from York University, and he studied supermassive black holes. And I actually know nothing about astronomy, so <laughs> you could probably imagine which one of us was better at the job. So with that, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jesse Rogerson. Wow, thank you, thank you, uh, Mathieu, that was awesome. Um, not true at all. He, he nailed it. Uh, uh, we both nailed it. Um, thanks for having me um, here uh, to moderate this discussion. The, the, the researchers that are here um, to talk about black holes are incredible from, uh, from so many different angles. So this is going to be a fun talk. I'm going to give you just a short introduction and then I'll pass it over to the first speaker. Um, so black holes for me have always been really interesting. This is where I really dove into um, in my research um, as a grad student. But the, the story of black holes has a really fun little history, and it starts um, when we first formulated what gravity actually is, and that was back with Newton. Um, so Newton created experimentally the first uh, understanding, mathematical understanding of what gravity is. And then when he did that, a bunch of people took that to the extreme and uh, started talking about, uh, well, what's the most gravity that we could have? What's the, the strongest thing we could have? What's the thing that could create gravity so much that it could hold on to light? Um, and that's sort of, that was in the sort of the 1700s, late 1700s, early 1800s is when these questions have started getting asked. Um, and and uh, so that's where it began. And then in the early 1900s, um, our favorite Einstein um, really pushed what gravity means and what gravity is and the formulation of gravity. And when Einstein did that, um, a bunch of other people uh, started uh, figuring out how to more formulate exactly what the most extreme thing is um, that you can make with, with general relativity. So we have this sort of um, push and pull between thinkers and um, uh, people who take that, that thought and push it to the extreme um, uh, of what a black hole is. Now, I'm going to give you just a short, a short introduction on what it means to me when I think about what a black hole is. So we're going to do a little thought experiment as a group, OK? So imagine um, you're out in a field right now, and you have a ball in your hand, and you throw that ball upwards. What happens to that ball? comes back down. It goes to a height depending on how strong you are, and, um, and it comes back down. Say you like, um, uh, gave it a, a little bit more uh, mustard, a little more juice. Same thing, right? It's going to go up, it's going to go a little higher, and it's going to come back down. OK. Now, you can imagine we, all, we found a way to break through that uh, with rockets. We, we give it a, little, a lot of pep, we give it a whole bunch of energy, and we can ex escape um, from, from the Earth. Now, imagine you did it with um, uh, a flashlight. Imagine you're out um, on, in your field at night, and you had a flashlight, and you point your flashlight upwards. What happens to the light? So it goes straight up. Now it spreads out, and you need a really strong laser to make it go any uh, distance. But it spreads out, but it keeps going. Gravity doesn't hold on to it, or at least not um, in the way that you can see. Um, a black hole is different. A black hole is a thing where the gravity is so strong that it affects light in a, in a very strong way. So, Let's do the same thought experiment. Imagine you, imagine you could, you can't, but imagine you could stand on the surface of a black hole, the object that is a black hole. You can't actually do that because it's a singularity. But if you had a flashlight, and you were there, and you shone your flashlight upwards, that light wouldn't just keep going. The gravity of the black hole would be so strong that it would be able to hold on to the light. That's one part of what a black hole is. The second part is that is size. So we have strong gravity and we have compactness. Uh, think about it in these terms. Imagine, uh, we go back to our field, you're standing on the field and you, you have your ball and you throw it up and it, it um, comes back down to you. If you were to take all of the mass of the Earth and crunch it to half the size, 
and you did the same experiment, the ball wouldn't go as high because you're, you're now closer to all of the mass of the Earth. The strength of gravity is able to pull, pull harder on the ball. So the more you crunch something down, the, it, the more it changes the, the way it pulls on things, the surface gravity, so to speak. And you can get to a point, if you crunch it down far enough, a, a certain amount of mass, where it will be so strong that light can escape. And we call that, um, we call beyond that mark the, the event horizon, that you create a singularity. Can anybody guess how small you'd have to make the Earth's mass for it to become a black hole? Some of you may know. Any guesses? Tennis balls, <laughs> Tennis balls close. Uh, it would fit in the palm of your hand. It would be about the size of a small marble. Now think about that. The Earth is huge. All of that mass, still the same mass, crunched into the size of a small marble. If you stood on that surface, light wouldn't be able to escape. So there's your thought experiments for the, for the day. So you have a little bit of an intro now, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. All right, Professor Suresh Savanandam, Assistant Professor at the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the Dunlop Institute um, here in Toronto. Uh, Suresh works in experimental astrophysics studying galaxy formation and evolution, um, particularly how galaxies form and assemble their stars. To enable his research, Suresh runs uh, a lab where he designs and builds novel astronomical instrumentation for large optical telescopes in the field of ap adaptive optics and infrared spectroscopy. So please welcome Suresh. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And I, I hope the fact that light cannot escape a black hole really sticks in your mind. So what I wanted to talk about is how do you actually discover black holes if you can't actually see them? And one key aspect of that is the gravity of the black hole. And that's in essentially what we have to use to infer the existence of black holes, until now, that is. And that will be the topic of the next speaker. So um, I wanted to go through a few things of you know, characteristics of black holes and a few techniques that we use today to know that they exist and a little bit of history to tie it all together and also technology. So first of all, I'm sure uh, a lot of us are familiar with Stellar, ma stellar mass black holes. These are black holes that, the, that are the size, uh, that have masses the size of stars, and they're within our galaxy. They're seen in a lot of movies that are actually sucking spaceships in. <coughs> you want the lights lower? Okay. Can everyone see that now? Yeah, I made all the, the slides dark because this is a black hole talk. <laughs> So this is just to give you a little bit of context of um, what kinds of black holes there are. So on the, on the far left, you have uh, remnants of large stars or, 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 or general stars that we have. Uh, when they die, they either turn into white dwarfs, bigger stars turn into neutron stars, and then even bigger stars uh, form black holes after they go supernovae. And on the bottom, what you have is the, the mass of the black hole, the weight in comparison with our sun. So stellar mass black holes usually weigh 10 to 100 times the mass of our sun. And then there's some stuff in between which we haven't really found any black holes. And then this is an area of active research right now to find what are called intermediate mass black holes. And then on the far right, you have what are called supermassive black holes. And these are found in centers of galaxies. These are extremely massive, ranging from millions millions of times the mass of the sun to billions of times. And, and these can be seen in cosmological distances. So how do we actually find black holes? And um, 
there, there are basically three major methods now. Uh, there are more, but these are, these are the ones that are quite commonly used. Uh, the first method, and these are all related to gravity itself, and, and the first method is to look at motions of companions around black holes, so binary systems or black holes with multiple companions. And because black holes themselves aren't visible, you can see what the companions are doing going around the black hole orbiting them, or the black hole orbiting the companion. Another way is to actually see black holes that are active. And by active, I mean there's some material that's falling into these black holes. And as this material falls in, the black hole accretes it. The material heats up and becomes very hot and luminous. And if you can detect these signatures, you can actually infer the existence of black holes. And the latest and greatest method for detecting black holes in the last five years is gravity waves. This is taking Einstein's general relativity to the extreme and looking at gra uh, black holes that are orbiting each other and spiraling inwards. They actually cause a ripple in space. And being able to detect this ripple, you can actually find these uh, inspiring black holes. So there's a little bit of history that is worth mentioning. I'm part of the Dunlap Institute, which was formed after uh, the sale of the lands surrounding the Dunlap Observatory up in Richmond Hill. Well, it turns out that one of the strongest evidence for stellar mass black holes was discovered there in 1971, looking at the orbit of a blue supergiant around a very um, dark companion that couldn't be seen uh, optically with our eyes. And what was observed here is the motion of the star around something that's invisible. And based on the orbit of the star and the speed of which it was orbiting at, um, a professor at, and an observer at the David Dunlap Observatory surmised that the dark object's mass was a few times, approximately three to four times the mass of our sun. And there's nothing other than a black hole that could actually explain the existence of that. And so, in fact, he didn't originally publish it right away. He was a bit skeptical. Uh, but there was an independent group in England that actually also got independent data that confirmed this, and at which point this was published in Nature. But it wasn't immediately accepted. Uh, Stephen Hawking actually made a bet with uh, Kip Thorne, saying that this is not a black hole. But I think he uh, eventually gave in, in the, at the 90s when there was uh, overwhelming evidence for this. So the other way to do this is to actually look at motions of stars going around a black hole. Um, in the previous case, what was used was uh, the spectroscopy of the star and looking at the Doppler shift of the star to look at its motion. But there's actually a way to act see stars that move around black holes. And for that, you need to use what's called adaptive optics, uh, which is shown here that those are the Keck telescopes in Hawaii firing lasers to the center of our Milky Way in order to measure the turbulence in the atmosphere. And what the turbulence does in our atmosphere is blur out the star. And if my animation continues, you could see what, in fact, that has. Um, sorry, there's supposed to be animation there. Um, the atmosphere actually causes the star to blur out. And if you can correct for that somehow by measuring the turbulence in the atmosphere, you can actually sharpen up the image of the star and get very high resolution images of the night sky. And with that, you can actually pinpoint the positions of stars very accurately and see how they're moving around uh, in space. So this is a, a great example of that. Uh, on the left, you see an image of the center of our Milky Way using no adaptive optics. This is just through free turbulent air and on the right, you actually see what happens when you turn on this, uh, this technology, adaptive optics. And you really sharpen things up. And you actually see more things at the very center of our Milky Way than you would without this technology. So it's, it's pretty amazing technology. And then you can painstakingly see, measure the positions of these stars over a period of a decade to see if there's something interesting there. And that's what um, several groups did in astronomy. And this is the result of one of those groups. So what you're seeing here is the motion of stars orbiting something that's invisible at the very center over there. That's the, the giant star there. That's called Sagittarius A star. 
And what you can do is you can or model the orbits of these stars and see how massive that object is at the very center. And you can see there's that one star with the yellow trace that just whips around the center. On the top right is actually the, the, the dates, so the years over which these measurements were taken. This is over a 20-year period where the positions of these stars were painstakingly measured. And with that came clear evidence that there was a supermassive black hole at the very center of our Milky Way. And this one weighs four million times the mass of our sun. So we're actually doing searches for intermediate mass black holes in my group. Uh, we're searching for these black holes in the centers of globular clusters. So there's a sequence of uh, masses for uh, black holes in centers of things. And so in, in galaxies, you get very massive black holes. Uh, in, in stellar systems, you get stellar mass black holes. And people are searching for intermediate mass black holes in globular clusters that are somewhere in between. We haven't found them yet but we're, we're hardly work, uh, working hard towards that. So I mentioned that the other way to look for black holes is uh, looking at the mat material that's being accreted onto the black hole around its accretion disk that gets very hot. Um, this is an artist's description of that. We wouldn't see that. So what can you do with that? So the material gets extremely hot, emits in the X-ray, and you also get jets. Uh, that are very bright in the radio, and you can actually infer the presence of this massive object that's generating all of this energy. So a famous example is uh, Messier 87, that's the largest elliptical galaxy, sorry, that shouldn't show up yet, uh, in our nearby universe, and it also harbors the most massive black hole in the nearby universe, about four, approximately four billion times the mass of our sun. And uh, there's a wonderful jet in the center of this galaxy, and it also has a very bright X-ray emission. And if you look at this jet in the radio, um, it's not shown to scale, but that's the energy being uh, pushed out of the galaxy from the central active galactic nucleus. Uh, this is another galaxy that's not too far from us, uh, Cent Centaurus A. And it also has an active galactic nucleus in the very center. And the different colors you see here, the, the white is just visible light, but the, um, the orange is radio, and the blue is x-ray. And this is really interesting because one of the big questions we have in galaxy formation and evolution is how do galaxies stop forming stars at some point and form these giant elliptical galaxies. And we think that it's due to the feedback from these active galactic nuclei. So with this technique, you can actually find these objects very far. I believe Jesse worked on quasars, and um, quasars are active galactic nuclei over cosmological distances. And in fact, the record right now is there's a quasar that's been discovered 13 billion light years away just shortly after the universe was formed. So pretty amazing stuff. These are extremely powerful engines. And lastly, and this, this is something that uh, amazes me, but I think uh, Professor Broderick's talk will amaze me even more, actually imaging the black hole, is looking at gravitational waves um, that are generated by inspiring black holes. This, this mesh that you see here is actually space, and as the black holes spiral inwards, they actually distort the space and send out gravitational waves. And right at the very end, when they coalesce, they actually generate a chirp, uh, which actually is detectable by instruments on the surface of our Earth, uh, particularly LIGO and Virgo, which are very precise instruments. And this is a new window. We're not actually seeing light coming from these objects. We're actually detecting ripples in space and um, actually finding these black holes. So, so far, these, this is sort of a collection of all the black holes that have merged. All the blue, blue ones are ones that have been detected through these techniques. They're about 40 to 80 times the mass of the sun. And they're from mergers of individual smaller black holes. And so this has opened up an entirely new window on studying black holes. Uh, that's all I had, and thank you very much.
Hello, again. So let me give me a second to get my notes. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Suresh. Great, uh, uh, great start for our talks. Um, our next speaker um, is Dr. Avery Broderick, Associate Professor um, at the University of Waterloo and the Delaney Family John Archibald Wheeler Chair in Theoretical Physics at the Perimeter Institute. So Dr. Avery Broderick uh, works to explain the fundamental physics of black holes and their observable characteristics and was a founding member of the um, Event Horizon Telescope collaboration uh, where Dr. Broderick participated in creating and interpreting the first um, uh, horizon resolving, the first image, so to, that's a nice way of saying it, the first image of a black hole resolving the event horizon that we spoke about earlier. And uh, uh, one in 20, the 2020 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for the first image that they created in that collaboration. So uh, please help me welcome uh, Dr. Broderick. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, let there be light. So uh, thank you, Jesse, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Suresh, for setting, uh, setting this talk up so brilliantly with this uh, view of how do we infer the existence of what uh, a physicist might say is completely unobservable. I'm going to talk about directly observing it. How do we see a black hole? Um, there are two pieces of physics that I think we need to begin with to understand how we can do this apparent impossibility. And the first is to discuss a little bit how does light fall in gravitational fields. So I think Jesse gave us this wonderful thought experiment of shining a light beam upward um, and you don't see a perceptible, a perceptible effect on the direction and the motion of the light. But we do know that light gravitates in Einstein's theory of gravity. And in fact, that gravitation of light produces unambiguous signatures right around a black hole where light is not bent into small deflections but into complete orbits. The consequence of light bending around the event horizon of a black hole is the creation of what we call the shadow. This is quite literally the image of the event horizon because that dark place for it to be filled in would have to have had light that began at or below the horizon propagating towards us. This is a purely gravitational effect and a consequence of gravity's impact on light. The second piece of physics that we have to entertain to understand this paradox is where did that light come from? And I think Suresh set this up perfectly when he talked about active galactic nuclei, this zoo of objects that can outshine their parent galaxies by factors of 100, enormously luminous. And we think that those are powered by black holes powered by black holes because the material that has fallen headlong in towards the black hole has fallen so very far and in that process converted an enormous fraction of their potential gravitational potential energy into heat and shown. It also generates outflows. These are these jets that Suresh mentioned. These we believe are generated by twisted up magnetic fields near black hole event horizons and they somehow accelerate material outward at light speed. So not only do we have black holes being some of the brightest objects in the universe, but we also have them accelerators able to launch things outward at near light speed. So that's kind of fun to wrap your head around. Astronomers and, and physicists often have very disparate pictures of what these objects are. And this has an impact. This is not negligible. It's not incidental. It's not merely uh, you know, fun to think about extreme physics. Here's a picture that shows, again, in three different colors, three very different versions of the universe. In white, everything you see is a galaxy. This is a galaxy cluster. All of these galaxies are orbiting about each other. And in blue, you see the X-ray emission from the hot intervening gas that pervades the cluster and rains down onto the galaxies and provides the raw material to form stars in those galaxies. But in red, you see the radio remnants, the relics, of past jet activity, past outflows that originated down near the horizon of the black hole in that central galaxy. And it has carved holes in that raw material. It's carved holes in that intracluster gas and is therefore ruling the fates 
of all of the galaxies in the cluster. So if you want to understand why those galaxies look the way they do, if you want to understand why the night sky looks the way it does, you really do need to understand a story that begins down at the event horizons of black holes. So why haven't we done that before? Well, Jesse gave us the answer. Black holes are also very compact. We know, as Suresh said, that there is a black hole. It's four million times the mass of the sun, so it's a behemoth by solar standards at the center of our galaxy. But even at four million times the mass of the sun, it subtends an angle of a mere 100 millionth of a degree. And Suresh told us about stellar mass black holes. There are closer stellar mass black holes, but they subtend angles one ten trillionth of a degree. I'm not even going to think about those. Maybe that's for my graduate students, graduate students. Okay, one one hundred millionth of a degree. The challenge of seeing that is akin to seeing a dime on the other side of the planet, not detecting its presence, but reading the date upon which the dime was struck. Or um, watching the hockey game in the moon, not like I saw my first hockey game in standard definition TV. So there's, we'll, we'll get the age gap by who recognizes what that means, as we used to call it TV where we would watch the hockey players huddle together and assume that they were chasing a puck, but who knows, they could have just been putting on a show. <laughs> but now in high definition, you can see the puck, right? That's what we need to be able to do to see the black hole at the center of our Milky Way. And it turns out that that's the largest object on the sky. It's not the biggest black hole, it's not the closest black hole, but it is the closest big black hole and presents the largest target, okay? And there are fundamental limits to what you can do, how high a resolution you can see. So some of you may be driving this evening. When you do, if you're, a, if you're a driver, please keep your eyes on the road. But if you're a passenger, take a look at the street lights. You will notice the street lights will look like stars. And that's kind of fun. And then you'll notice that all the street lights look like the same star. And then you might tilt your head and notice all the stars are tilting with you. And that's because the star is not in the street lights. It's in your eye. You are witnessing diffraction through your pupil. This is a wave optics property of light that fundamentally limits the smallest thing that a telescope can resolve. So if you told me how big a telescope was, its aperture diameter, I can tell, and the wavelength at which you observe, I can tell you how high a resolution you can see. So this is a picture of my backyard telescope. It's an eight inch Newtonian reflector. And here we have the diffraction pattern that my telescope sees. So when I look at a star on a very, very clear night, ignoring all of the stuff about uh, the atmospheric turbulence, which my telescope is not high enough resolution to actually see, um, this is what I would see. I would see the star smeared out into about one five thousandth of a degree. Remember, one hundred millionth is our target. This is not a job for my backyard. Of course, we have bigger telescopes, but they are still 500 times too low resolution. We have bigger telescopes on the horizon, right? We're building bigger telescopes now, or at least trying to. Again, too low resolution by a factor of 100. But there's a, something of a, a miracle, a millimeter miracle. There's a technique by which we can take telescopes across the planet and join them together and effectively make a telescope the size of the Earth. This is a technique called very long baseline interferometry, one that Canada helped pioneer. The very first experiments with this technique were done between Algonquin in Penticton, so I think we have some national pride there. And at a millimeter, the size of the Earth is the size of the telescope you need. But also, at a millimeter, all of the techniques for performing this experiment work. And at a millimeter, the atmosphere is transparent enough for us to see above it. And at a millimeter, the sources that we might want to see are transparent all the way down to their event horizon. So that's three coincidence, or four, sorry, four coincidences. You, you understand why I'm an astronomer, not a mathematician. Four coincidences. It didn't have to be, uh, but they are. And, and as a result, we were called to generate or create this instrument, the Event Horizon Telescope, an instrument with a singular purpose to uh, visualize, to image, to directly probe, spatially resolve the event horizons of known black holes. And this required deploying uh, developing and deploying technology to the very ends of the Earth to build this Earth-sized telescope. So I'm going to take you on a tour. I'm going to start with Virgo, because on April 5th, 2017, all eight telescopes of the Event Horizon Telescope turned and pointed 
towards a galaxy in Virgo. Messier 87, this galaxy that Suresh mentioned. And as I take us on this tour, every su uh, subsequent slide, every subsequent image is going to be visible in the primary image so that we know how much we've zoomed in. So I'm a theorist, so it's only appropriate, and I live in Waterloo, and the night sky's a little bit hard to see. Um, it is appropriate that I'm using Stellarium for this. We zoom in once, Twice, already at twice, we see that Virgo is a happening place. It is the home of the Virgo supercluster, more than 2,000 galaxies all orbiting each other. The brightest galaxy in the Virgo supercluster is Messier 87. Here, I think, is one of the pictures that Suresh put up. And already, you can start to see one of these powerful outflows emanating from the core. That's not an artifact. That is real. And here's the Hubble Heritage image of this jet. You can see it starts off from this bright ball at the center, emanates outward, and that's the highest resolution optical image I'm going to show you. The next is going to be a radio image. You're going to have to don your radio eyes. And there's that VLA image that Suresh showed. The VLA is an array very much like the Event Horizon Telescope, except it all fits in Socorro, New Mexico. Now we've moved on to Earth-sized telescopes, but telescopes that operate at nearly uh, 15, 150 times uh, the wavelength of the uh, Event Horizon Telescope. In each of these, we see a bright core and an extended jet-like feature. And I'm going to pause here for a minute. This is an Earth-sized 3 millimeter array operating at, at uh, about three times the wavelength of the Event Horizon Telescope and three times lower resolution nominally. There's the bright core at the center. We believe the black hole lurks within that. You see the extended jet. And we've already zoomed in by a factor of 70 million. It didn't feel that much, like that much, right? This is, this is the, uh, the miracle or tyranny of uh, the geometric sequence. Remember that when you invest. <laughs> and on April 10th, this is the image we released. OK, the highest resolution image of M87 ever taken. And the very first in which you can see the shadow of the black hole. The first time we can see gravity imposing itself on this image and producing that dark interior surrounded by a bright ring of light. Now, of course, the Event Horizon Telescope is not all about taking a picture. In fact, taking a picture is merely the beginning. I have spent uh, more than 15 years working on this. And uh, I am not, in fact, an astronomer. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I spend my time trying to figure out what this picture means. And the Event Horizon Telescope, therefore, has spent almost as much time developing this interpretation capability. Here's a picture that shows a subset of the numerical simulations of the near black hole environment that we produced. We've generated the largest library of such simulations ever assembled, requiring supercomputers across the globe to generate. It's with, it, with these and with other methods that I could talk to you for another hour about, we began to start trying to interpret that image and achieve or reach robust conclusions about what we saw. But I'm not going to tell you about those. I'm just going to mention one. And that is, for the first time, we've been able to measure the mass of a black hole, not with the dynamics of material objects like stars or gas, but by the dynamics of photons, by watching those photons make orbits about the black hole and come to us. This is by far the closest mass measurement of a black hole ever made. We have confined all this mass to within about 50% further out than the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole itself. And that is six and a half billion suns, plus or minus one. And in fact, all of the work goes into that plus or minus one. This is not the first measurement of a mass of M87. As Suresh noted, you can also look at the dynamics of stars. And that's been done as well. That had been done some time ago. And they found a mass estimate of 6 plus or minus 1. So this is entirely consistent within the error bars. But importantly, this mass measurement is from 100,000 times further away. This mass measurement is arrived at from watching stars on uh, 60 light year distances, 100 light year distances, as opposed to light hour distances. What stitches these two mass estimates together is your understanding of the dynamics of stuff around black holes, the dynamics driven by gravity. That is to say, it is Einstein's theory of gravity that connects these two. And so this provides a first test of general relativity 
all the way from the space between stars down to the event horizons of black holes. Of course, the Event Horizon Telescope is one window on black holes, one that we are not finished looking through, but one window. And we are very fortunate now to be in an era where we have many such windows opening. And Suresh mentioned LIGO, the study of gravitational waves. And I think that together we're beginning to see some very exciting things. The very first event that uh, LIGO saw, that gra the very first black hole merger that LIGO detected, produced a black hole that was about 60 solar masses. Okay, that's 100 million times smaller in mass than M87. Okay, eight orders of magnitude different. By now, LIGO has seen objects that are seven solar masses. Right, so that's nine orders of magnitude, a factor of a billion in mass. And yet, it appears that those objects in M87 are similar in the mathematical sense. That is, I could scale up LIGO's smallest object and it would look like M87. Or I could scale down M87 and it would look like LIGO's object. Uh, one of the key predictions of general relativity, a remarkable fact, and one of the reasons why I study black holes, because they're simple. Suresh also mentioned active galactic nuclei. This is an image of the universe, not in the optical, not in the radio, but in the gamma ray. And in the gamma ray, you see the universe peppered with bright dots. And every bright dot you see that's not in the galactic plane is an accreting supermassive black hole. In fact, it's a special subclass of accreting supermassive black hole. So every bright dot you see is actually representative of another tens of thousands of other objects that are also accreting supermassive black holes. You see these circled by these little white circles in this map. Everything we think we're learning about black holes with the Event Horizon Telescope Everything we think we learn with LIGO also informs our understanding of all of these objects across the night sky. So where is direct imaging going? The first is other targets. We mentioned the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It is the largest. It is the best target. We are working on it. We're also looking at the universe in different eyes, seeing polarization. So those of you who like to sail or like to uh, ski or may be aware of polarized sunglasses and the like, light has a direction. Also other wavelengths. We'll be moving to multichromatic views of the universe, increasing our resolution by 50% as we do so. The first experiments for that are this year. And the era of black hole photography, I think, was short. We are now moving directly onto the era of black hole cinematography. We want to make movies. And where we see in movies dynamics, we're able to elucidate the physics of the uh, near black hole region. There we are. So finally, I'd like to note that projects like the Event Horizon Telescope are only possible with large collaborations. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be a member of a collaboration that has uh, feet across the globe on six of seven continents. We have Antarctica, that's the hard one. I'm not sure why we, well, it turns out that there aren't very tall, many tall mountains in uh, Australia, so that's why we don't have Australians. Maybe we'll fix that. Uh, a global telescope requires this kind of global collaboration, and it cuts across many cultural divides, both uh, societal, but also professional. The Event Horizon Telescope works because we have engineers who know how to build critical pieces of the equipment that goes into making these observations possible, all the way to highfalutin theorists like myself who sit here and dream on computers and try to make uh, 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 predictions and interpretations. And so all honor and glory should belong to the collaboration and any errors such as they are were mine. Thank you. Me again. <clears throat> All right, we have one more talk. Um, so thank you, Dr. Broderick, for the, for the last one on imaging black holes. And we're going to move on um, uh, to another take on this. Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce to you Dr. Christina Smith, postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Earth and Space Sciences and Engineering at York University here in Toronto, Co former colleague of mine when I was there at York. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Smith she, uh, is focused on studying planetary atmospheres at the moment um, and is a member of the Mars Science Laboratory, which you all know as uh, Curiosity, roving around on Mars. Um, she recently joined the Juno mission as a participating scientist, which is going to be a, re a really great mission, um, and uh, completed her PhD in astrophysics at the University of Manchester in UK, uh, studying uh, evolving stars, and is a huge sci-fi nerd. So everybody, please uh, welcome Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse, for that introduction. Um, yeah, as I said, I got, the, I got a really fun brief uh, to kind of talk to you about black holes in pop culture. And as Jesse mentioned, that was because I am a massive sci-fi nerd. Um, and I'm probably not the only one in the room. Um, yeah, so this is a really, really fun topic for me. Um, so black holes are really pervasive in, in pop culture, and I'm not talking just... Uh, science fiction movies and TV shows, so that is the area that I will be kind of generally focusing on because that's what I like to watch and yeah. <laughs> um, but also you have things in, it's spread as far as like music, so I put Muse's Supermassive Black Hole up there, um, the title, <laughs> um, and they're used in a bunch of different ways and initially I was going to approach this as the good, the bad and the funny about black holes in pop culture, how they're used as something interesting that needs to be investigated something that's going to come and get you, or something that's kind of the punchline of a joke. Uh, and I'm looking at kind of The Simpsons, Futurama, and Red Dwarf in those ones. Um, but it turns out that's actually a really difficult thing, because along with being something funnier that's the punchline of a joke, generally it brings in some peril for your characters. Or um, as well as it being an interesting thing, it also brings along some peril for your characters. So I kind of, yeah, kind of went off on, on that. Um, but yeah, these are just some of the things that include, it's not an exhaustive list, that include black holes. In some cases, they are actually, do I have that? No. Um, they're actually like this pivotal point. For example, Walt Disney's The Black Hole. Given it's in the title, you expect it to kind of be a really central part um, to something that's just kind of a passing interest that they have to kind of look at. Um, so one of the things I should say is I'm going to try not to give too many spoilers. Most of the things I'm talking about are older now. Um, but if you haven't seen Interstellar and you don't want to know anything about it, last couple of slides, stick your fingers in your ears. I'm going to try my best not to give any spoilers away just in case. <laughs> it's important, these things. <laughs> so the things that if a black hole is brought into a story, the number one thing that in my mind is it's brought in as like, a massive, massive vacuum cleaner. Like, it is just going to suck everything in, and you've either got to escape it or kind of run away from it, uh, kind of like in The Simpsons, where they, you have to, you know, that's, that's their little black hole there, uh, sucking everything in, poor little lard lad. Um, and I really appreciate just how The Simpsons are having to run away from this black hole right there. Um, and most of the time, yeah, it is considered to be this massive vacuum cleaner, which kind of, yeah, they have a huge gravitational pull, but say, for example, if our sun was replaced in immediately, so not particularly scientifically, but, you know, if suddenly you could snap your fingers and replace the sun with a black hole of the same mass, very important, the same weight, um, the effect would be, aside from, you know, it would suddenly go dark and really, really cold, we wouldn't suddenly get sucked into it like a, hum like, like a massive vacuum cleaner. Um, so that's kind of one thing that is used a lot, is this kind of massive, like, bring everything in, got to run away, ah, it's scary. Um, then the next thing that I find is the other thing, is the a second thing that comes in a lot, is it does some weird stuff with time. And I don't think this was mentioned before, but um, in addition to kind of creating these, this, this really strong gravitational field, um, if you are really, really close to something very, very large, very, very dense, really strong gravity, it's going to mess with the time. It's going to slow you. It's going to relatively slow you down because time is not constant everywhere from one person's perspective. It all gets a bit weird, um, and that's used a lot 
as a, either as a basis for a show, in the case of like Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda, if anybody has seen that, <laughs> um, and sometimes just as a bit of a, a whole plot point. And this is one of my favorite shows, so this is why I'm kind of talking about it. It's called Stargate SG-1. For anybody who's not familiar, that device on the right makes a little, uh, little, makes a big wormhole, <laughs> um, an artificial one between Earth and various other planets. And in this particular one, they accidentally connect to a place that has a black hole, um, and that causes a lot of problems. So often I take my science hat off for science fiction and TV shows, um, <laughs> just because, you know, I like to enjoy them. Um, and for this one, assuming that that's all fine and that the effects of the black hole can kind of come in through the wormhole, they actually have some real fun and some real um, interesting explorations of the effects of time and also the gravity pull. Um, so kind of initially, time starts to slow down the closer you are to this black hole compared to outside their base. Um, someone can go off and make a phone call, go to Washington and back in the same time, and they're like, what? <laughs> um, and yeah, they also have a bit of fun with kind of the, the laws of physics. Um, kind of time kind of comes through and, and move, the effects of the time dilation come through before the gravitational ones, which stresses out a lot of the characters, which I kind of enjoy, because it would also stress me out if <laughs> the laws of physics were suddenly not working anymore. Um, and yeah, at least there's some really fun things. Um, yeah, and just as a fun fact, this is not down, this is actually a cross being pulled into the, black, in, into the wormhole via the black hole's gravitational pull. And then even weirder stuff. So if them kind of just pulling everything in and messing around with time was not enough. You get a whole series of weird things because black holes are, they kind of spark a lot of the imagination because you can't see within the event horizon as was, you know, as was discussed earlier. So people get very creative with this and leads to a lot of odd things, a lot of interesting things, a lot of cool things. Um, and yeah, we can discuss that at length, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, just this is the main way. Suck stuff in, weird time stuff, even weirder stuff. That's my summary of the way that they're generally used. Um, so I also kind of wanted to tie this back into imaging um, and how they are shown visually, because I think this is really kind of cool. This is like an evolution of how they've been shown. And on the left in the middle is obviously The Simpsons. <laughs> um, and there's Futurama in the middle. And there are some things that are very, very similar. Um, a lot of them have this disk of material, which is kind of slowly spinning into the black hole. It's called an accretion disk. Um, and in a lot of cases, there's this disk surrounding an actual hole um, that people can fly into or get sucked into. Um, and a black hole is actually a three-dimensional object. So that's something that I, I really liked about Interstellar. So if you haven't seen this, this is the point to stick your fingers in your ears. Um, and yeah, that's the picture kind of down at the bottom that looks a little bit different. Um, but there's things I like about all of these. They all kind of show the spinning material. Um, interestingly, there are no, none of the jets that were kind of being talked about with the supermassive ones. That's an interesting point. Um, they're mostly kind of fairly calm, calm black holes. Um, but yeah, this one, uh, so these images are actually taken from a paper that came out of um, making the visuals for Interstellar. Because they actually ran a lot of simulations as to how, if you were close enough, and not fallen apart and not pulled into the black hole, important, um, that how it would appear. Um, and this is a super massive black hole. It is enormous, millions and millions of mass, times the mass of the sun. Um, and it has this kind of calm little disk around it. It's not been fed in a very long time, was what I, I was reading about it. Um, but it has this interesting kind of lensing effect. So you see, these are kind of the simulations on the right-hand side. And this is the kind of how it appeared in the movie. Um, and this was showing uh, the bottom shows, so when things are moving towards you, moving away from you, they can be shifted to different colors. Um, but they decided to kind of keep keep that out in the movie. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing is, oh, whoops, I did not mean to do that. Um, the interesting thing I found is that it's, you can see all of the distortion, all of the bending, um, and it gives this kind of really interesting halo around, and then the disc looking through, the disc kind of going through, and it's actually the disc, I believe, being bent around the black hole itself in these simulations. So you're kind of looking at it edge on, so the disc is going kind of right across the middle. And I just thought that was a really interesting, a really cool thing. And kind of since Interstellar, I've seen them depicted a lot more as a spherical object rather than like a hole that you can fall into. Um, and this was just kind of demonstrating the lensing uh, that can happen. 
And we kind of had a few discussions about this, but I just thought it was a nice thing to see how when you have kind of a really big object in the foreground, a really heavy object like a galaxy, can actually kind of bend the light around. So this is uh, just something that I thought to kind of um, emphasize that point. Um, and kind of to end, I would be kind of talking about the visuals, not a black hole, but I just really appreciated the way they showed a wormhole and how that was a three-dimensional object as well, and it kind of showed a really distorted and lensed view of the other side of the wormhole. And again, there were simulations done on that. Um, so yeah, all in all, uh, I think there's some really interesting things about black holes and the way they're presented. Often there's something super scary, something you can run away from. Um, kind of unfairly, often. I don't think they're necessarily an inherently evil thing that's trying to eat you up. Um, but yeah, so thank you. And that's kind of the end of my talk. There you go, now you got a good start at crying around what uh, black holes are, where, where we're looking at them, the pop culture inferences. I want to uh, please uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Smith and all of our speakers, and we're going to invite them back up. Come on up. So now this is the fun part, right? Because this is where you get to pick their brains. Um, and you can see from all of, all of what you've seen so far, um, that black holes are really, they're these enigmas. And even as far back as the 1700s, we're, it, it's hitting on that point of, well, what's the, what's the most extreme thing we can think of? And um, how can we look at that thing? How can we understand that thing? Um, and you, scientists are still figuring out how to do this, as, uh, as you see with the techniques in, in sort of trying to image them, simulate them, um, peer beyond that, um, event horizon that we cannot peer beyond, and then um, how the, the sci-fi world and the storytelling world pulls in those pieces of, un, of unknown and, and fear and scariness and blackness and uh, things that don't shine and how you find them. Um, so it, all of that sort of swirls around in a really weird and interesting um, milieu. So it's a, there's a lot to, to dig into here, and I want to make sure that everybody gets their questions, so I'll stop talking. And if you have a question, throw your hands up. There are microphones somewhere. Um, oh, there's one. So who wants to get her started? Okay, let's, yeah, let's start right there. You're right beside them. My name is not Jerry Cooper. Yeah. Uh, my experience in physics or astronomy is the pictures we saw today and similar pictures we've seen in humans. There's no symmetry. And the way I expect the big bang to happen is that we have everything in the space for, say, a ball of, of, of tennis. And there's a, an explosion. You may expect everything will be completely symmetric. How is it that what we see is completely asymmetric, completely at random? Great question. Why does it appear to be asymmetric? Why does a, the images of a black hole, um, the simulations of a black hole, uh, the attempts we make to see them and understand them, why does it appear asymmetric but should be symmetric, at least for understanding? Who wants to jump in? Well, so, so I think I think there are two pieces to that. So one is the symmetry of the space-time around black holes. And the second, I think you were asking, why is there asymmetry in the universe at all? Why is there structure in the universe at all? And so, so, so on the second one um, begets an answer in parts of the first one, and, and that is uh, a, a, just a just a collection or a cloud of matter is unstable to gravitational collapse, and if you have very very small imperfections in the symmetry, they will grow exponentially in time. And so, so this is what's responsible for the growth of structure. Now, now, where did those small perturbations come from? There are stories that we tell. Okay, it, has, it has to do with quantum fluctuations and the, in the impliton field and all that. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to tell you those stories. But the, the small, even if you have near, nearly, nearly micros or very microscopic fluctuations, they will grow. And and when you hear people studying the cosmic microwave background, in some sense they're trying to study the early growth of those fluctuations. Now, one of the things that happens when matter starts to collapse is instability is that you'll, you'll generate pockets of angular momentum. Even if the universe didn't have any angular momentum at all to begin with, 
One pocket will be turning clockwise, the other one counterclockwise, so the sum is, is zero, but <coughs> each one of them have angular momentum. And that's what is responsible for choosing directions for these jets, responsible for choosing the direction of accretion flows, and does affect the symmetry of the space-time of objects that collapse within this, within this flow. So, so when we talk about uh, black holes, they're, they, they, they're actually highly symmetric objects by astronomical standards. I mean, the sun is a very good sphere, but it's not an exact sphere, and we see prominences all the time, right? Uh, the Earth is a pretty decent sphere, but you can measure its, its lack of spheroidal, uh, you know, the deviations from sphere. Saturn is one of my favorites, because it's spinning like the Dickens. Um, you only think it's spherical if, if you don't have a ruler because you see the rings and they kind of, you, you, you know to be biased when you see the rings. But actually it's about 15% wider at the equator than it is at the poles, right? Um, but, but black holes are, uh, so we're chilled black holes, non-rotating black holes are perfect spheres. And rotating black holes are cylindrically symmetric around, right, but not necessarily symmetric. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in polar angle and latitude. Um, what really breaks the symmetry in all the images we saw was this, was this first statement about the symmetry of the accretion material around the black hole. And the light that's emitted, we see some rotating with the black hole, some rotating against the black hole, and then that impacts what it ultimately looks like. So that's in some sense an apparent effect. Any addition? No? All right, let's throw it back to the crowd. I saw one, I saw your yourself. Did you have a question? Yeah? Where's our runner? Right. <laughs> I get to direct the people. Right there. Yeah. My question is, like, how does supermassive black hole form? Great question. How does the supermassive black hole form? Uh, I can try and take that question. So it's the way, and I think you set it up uh, really well, so the universe forms, and possibly there might be some seed black holes in the universe uh, at, at the centers of where the first galaxies will eventually form into. And then it's imagined that every galaxy in a uh, long time ago will have a smaller black hole that would then, as they merge and form bigger galaxies, these black holes would then uh, merge together and form a bigger black, a black hole. And during the merging process, a lot of gas gets funneled into the centers of these galaxies, making these black holes even bigger. And so you, you hierarchically form bigger and bigger black holes as more and more galaxies merge together to build a big galaxy like the one we saw in Messier 87. And there's actually a relationship that people have measured that show uh, rough, that's roughly related to the mass of the galaxy itself and the mass of the supermassive black hole that's found in the center that lends evidence to this idea that uh, Black, supermassive black holes are built up through mergers of smaller galaxies. And I wonder if I can ask you, because I'm interested. There's, we, we understand the mechanism of, the, of how a star creates a stellar mass black hole, and we understand roughly the mechanism you're just talking about of how you make the supermassive black holes early, early, early on. And you're investigating the ones in the middle. So how do you make those, those intermediate ones? And uh, how do you, what, what is, I guess my question is, uh, the the merging with the uh, LIGO and the Virgo, is that the way to build an intermediate mass by smashing little ones together? Yeah, that's one possible mechanism, or uh, it depends on the formation scenario of globular clusters themselves, whether you know they were a smaller gravitational perturbation that had um, formed a, a smaller mass black hole before. Cool. All right, back to the crowd. Right here in front row. And I'll move back. I'm going to move up there, don't worry. So the question, oh, there's lots of hands up there. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll start. Let's start here. No, no, we need Mike. We need Mike. Uh, hi. So my question is about time and the effect of black holes on time. So in the movie Interstellar, there was a planet, and I believe it was positioned close to a black hole. And uh, because of that, it affected time on the planet. And I think it was something like, for every hour on the planet, it would translate it to eight Earth years. Um, and I could never really wrap my mind around how that was possible, so. So that's, yeah, that's really an interesting um, thing in the movie Interstellar, because they did try and keep things 
scientifically explainable or that there'd be some kind of science behind it, even if it was unlikely to happen, they always wanted it to be kind of grounded in science. And that was one of the um, one of the important aspects of the story was you have one hour to every uh, every X number of years, seven years, eight years um, on Earth. And initially, I believe the, the science advisor Kit Thorne said, that that's too much for you to be kind of parked in an orbit and then have it be kind of one hour for every, uh, for every seven years. That's too much. And then he found that if it was a big enough black hole and it was spinning quickly enough, sure. you could get that kind of uh, that kind of time effect. Um, and that, to me, was really interesting. The fact that it had to be spinning. It had to be spinning at a very, very fast rate, fast enough that it had this visual kind of flattening that you were talking about earlier, um, which they decided to not put in the visuals and kind of have it spinning a lot slower so it looked much rounder. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, it comes from um, kind of what I mentioned before, when you're very, very, when you're close to the event horizon of a black hole, time relative, time for you is still moving, but if you were observing somebody at or close to the event horizon, it would appear that time was slowing down or time had almost gone to a standstill. We were discussing this in the green room earlier. Um, so, and it's, it, it's emphasized when the black hole is spinning because it's kind of causing whirlings in space time. It all gets a little bit weird. I don't know if you guys want to expand on it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, was, this is the shocking bit of special relativity, right? Um, you know, pr prior to special relativity, time was a master of us all, and, and now each of us has our own master <coughs> that follows us around. And it's just the imperceptible, the differences. Um, but every every time you're on the 401, time is really slowed down for you. It's not just the time. <laughs> And and, it, and it's a very similar a very similar concept down near black hole that, that uh, you're you're down near the black hole time appears to slow down for, for you from, from other people exactly. And they actually sorry, <laughs> they actually had did some interesting experiments here on Earth and um, I believe it was a 73 uh, floor high building and they did they measured to an incredible accuracy um, the time at, in the basement and the time on the top floor and found that, so within their uncertainty, which was tiny, 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 minuscule, I cannot remember the numbers off the top of my head, that was a measurable difference, and it's something that I believe does have to be taken into account with things like uh, GPS satellites uh, in orbit as well. So it's a great way of making money uh, if you want to live longer, <laughs> just live on the surface of a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> money making tips, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I'm gonna pass it up to the balcony. They have a question uh, way up there. I apologize. This is a question from a four-year-old daughter. So she's wondering why around black hole we see red and yellow colors. Why the accretion disk, I guess, is this color? Good question. So, so, so when, when you ask that, are, um, so are, you, are you imagining the picture from the Event Horizon Telescope? Why, why it was bright red, like, like that right there? Um, because it's a it's a neat color scheme. <laughs> Actually, the Event Horizon Telescope uh, it, it, right now um, is, is single color. It's 1.3 mm, uh, millimeter wavelength photons. So we only really see one color, and it's just a brightness variation. But uh, the human eye is much more perceptive of color differences than brightness differences. So all of our pictures look like that. But, but there's also a relationship to, to uh, a question, that, that question and the prior one about time. Because it certainly is true that light is redshifted from down here to the black hole for exactly the same reason that time appears to slow down. So, so if I were to, I, I have a green laser pointer, and so if I were to shine a green laser pointer uh, around here, um, that would be unsafe, and I shouldn't do it. But the more I do, it would appear green, but as I march closer and closer to the event horizon, you would see it become progressively more yellow, then more orange, and then more red, and then, and then you'd see me um, gesturing wildly, and that would be left, all that's left. And, and that redshift is exactly this time delay. Um, and, and that's observationally detectable. One of the ways people measure things about rotating black holes is measuring uh, features that look like they're very, very redshifted down in the horizon. Awesome. All right. Oh, this person right here, blue shirt. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, yeah, I have a question about the same image over there and how you guys mentioned that like, we're looking at the shadow. So I just want to get an idea of what we're looking at. Does that mean that the actual like uh, 
singularity is way down in there, and we're just seeing the gap in the light from the accretion disk. Is that right? Yeah, so, so um, the question is, what do we mean by shadow, right? So all, all of the light that would have filled in that central region, the photons that would have come from the accretion flow and filled in that central region, hit their bla the black hole, hit the horizon, and are, and, are, and are captured. So in that sense, it's very much exactly a shadow. Um, we don't see the singularity because it's hidden from view, right? Thankfully for the theorists, because we don't know what to do with the singularity. So you know, we just shuffle that under, you know, some people shuffle things under rugs, there is shuffle things under horizons and we're good. But, but uh, yeah, so, so in principle, there ought to be something in there, but you only, the only way to find out is you have to go. Then you don't get to tell us though. <laughs> there's a price for knowledge. Um, person, yeah, in the white here, and then I'll move uh, to the further back afterwards. And then we'll, don't worry, I won't forget you up there. So my question is regarding one of the animations that was shown that, you know, the one of the objects which was rotating, it was observed for about eight years, ten years or something. So what's the maximum time that you've seen, you know, how long that has been observed so that the conclusion is made that, you know, you have a black hole there? And my second question is, you know, what's the fundamental difference between the black and the white hole? Hmm. Uh, I'll answer, answer the first question. Um, so, the time that's required there is simply to be able to measure the orbits of the stars that go around this object that's invisible. And <clears throat> in order to get precise enough measurements of these orbits, I think they spent, I think initially it was about 10 years of observations, painstakingly looking at stars that are going around the center. And uh, the, the, the video I showed was about 20 years, so the, the observations continue. I think in the future, when we have bigger optical telescopes, the amount of time that you need to measure things more precisely will, will shorten dramatically because you can get higher resolution images closer towards the supermassive black hole and the Milky Way. So it's, it's really just taking the time and mapping out orbits of stars. It's, that's what that time is for. White holes? White holes. All right. Anybody? Sure. Oh, we're diving off the deep end now. White, well, well, maybe, right? So, so um, uh, general relativity is a mathematical theory, and there are there are um, solutions that you can write down which may or may not have a basis in, in reality. Uh, white holes are, in some, in, in a very literal sense, a time reversed version of a black hole. At the at the event horizon of the white hole, things have to be flowing outward. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a bona fide solution, um, but there is no process that has yet been um, identified that would produce one. So if you start with sort of generic conditions in the universe, you will produce black holes. Um, but there is no process that we know of to generate the solution that's white hole. So, so in some sense, it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. There's a, there's a solution. In, in Einstein's general relativity, but we, we don't have any way to actually um, reach that solution. And, and so then it just becomes sort of an interesting foil for discussion, but, but not a practical physical object. Let's go up to the balcony up there. Any questions up there? Oh, yes, one person right here. I hope this question isn't too far off topic, but I gather that there's been a paper this week in Nature which refers to a crisis in cosmology. And if I understand, the, understand it correctly, two perfectly respectable scientific processes have come up with ages of the universe which are mutually incompatible. I wonder if, uh, if anybody on the uh, uh, panel has anything to say about that. I just work at a museum, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think those three. I'll leave on that then. The, um, so, so I think sometimes there's a perception of scientists being doctrinaire and, and, and uh, you know, there's an accumulated wisdom and we all follow that. That, that, is, that is as far from the truth as possible. Uh, most of us are raging egomaniacs and we love nothing more than to find the evidence that all of the great lights before us were absolute fools and 
missed the other before that face, but we are going to see the light. So, um, you know, we, I, I don't speak from personal experience. <laughs> but but, but this, this paper said, you know, it's wonderful to have conundrums. And every time we think we have the universe uh, all tied up in a neat bow, there's a, there's a curve thrown our way. This is not the first time. I think it has become a, a little bit more humble about it. Um, in this instance, um, like, like many such statements, uh, this is not the only such potential crisis in cosmology. Um, in this instance, it may very well be a matter of ununderstood systematic errors. Okay, so, so this, is, this is sort of an interesting statement on what error means in science. And I mentioned 90, 99% of the work goes into that plus or minus one. Well, that's, that's, that's just generally true. Making a measurement is easy. Understanding what you've measured is very hard. And, and uh, you know, we, we require uh, often for, for convincing statements or something to be elevated to, to the level of, we think that's pretty certainly true, uh, we call Six Sigma. So those of you in the business world will you know, wear books named Six Sigma. Six Sigma means it would never have happened by accident in the age of the universe many times. Um, why would we require that standard? A bank will give you a million dollars in Toronto, maybe, maybe many millions of dollars, to buy a house on, on a one in 20 chance you'll pay them back. <laughs> so why would we ever require this ridiculous degree of certainty? It's because we don't trust each other. Because um, when somebody says, this is a one in 20 chance of being wrong, we're like, yeah, you really mean one in two. <laughs> you know, because half of all of those statements turn out to be false. And, and by the time you get to Six Sigma, you know, many times the age of the universe would be required for, for you know, one, one experiment like this to be wrong. Um, and we're like, okay, so maybe, maybe it's pretty credible that, that you know, all of the things you didn't understand about how well you've measured it are, are probably small enough now that at least it's a one in a hundred. Right? And, and uh, in this instance, I think that we're in this camp where we're kind of a little unsure of how serious to take this particular, this particular uh, uh, crisis. How, however, we are in this age of precision cosmology. And, and those of us on the panel, and, uh, uh, many others are really excited about the age of precision gravity, precision black hole research. And the name of the game is to push these measurements ever further to ever higher precisions and to find exactly these crises, which then point the way towards a better understanding of the universe. I feel a lot better about trying to buy a house. Um, <laughs> there's a young person in the back over here that had a question. My first question is, why, uh, why did the Event Horizon Telescope pinpoint to the Sagittarius A instead of the closest stellar black hole? And my second question is that, uh, my second question is, the, the accretion disk, uh, why the Christian disk spin so fast, and why is it so hot? Great fundamental question. <laughs> yeah, that's good. A absolutely. So, so the um, Sagittarius A star is, is uh, four million times as massive as the sun, and, and the apparent size on the sky goes up with mass, but down with distance. <coughs> Okay? And in fact, it's the ratio that matters. It's four million times the mass of the sun, so that's big. So that's good. It makes it nice and big and, and easier to see. I won't say easy, but easier. Um, but it is 24,000 light years away. Whereas uh, the closest known stellar mass black hole is uh, it's about 3,000, 4,000 light years away. So that's closer. But it's also only about seven solar masses. So, so it's a hundred thousand times, almost a million times less massive. So even though it's three times closer, maybe, maybe 10 times closer, it's, it's uh, almost a million times smaller. So that makes it almost impossible for us to see with the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, one thing, not, 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 not to terrify everybody, but um, if you believe that every massive star ended its light as a, as a black hole, which we do, um, and then you count up how many stars there are in the galaxy, which you can, you get that the nearest black hole is probably maybe 10 times the distance to the nearest star away from us. 
maybe 20 times. That's a little bit. That, that, that would be good for a late night sci-fi movie. <laughs> uh, any agents can call me. So, so, so that's why, that's why we, we looked at, at the, these big black holes, because they are um, easier to resolve. They, they just produce larger shadows, easier to resolve, even though they're a little bit further away. Black hole in M87 is way further away than the one in the center of our galaxy. It's also way bigger, almost 2,000 times further away. But it's 2,000 times more massive, so that cancels. Your other question, why? Are accretion flows so hot? So, um, how many people have been to the CN Tower? So that's really a question. How many people have had people visit you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, surely, when you go up to the CN Tower, there are some young people who are like, "Let's throw something off." <laughs> right? And what would you see if you threw something off? Well, you know, but of course, because we're all budding Galileos, not Thomas. So you throw something off, and you would see it begin to accelerate, right? And start to fall down more and more and more rapidly. And if, and if you take high school physics, you'll, you'll calculate the speed at which it will land on the ground, and the further down or further, uh, down it falls, so the higher you dropped it from, the faster it's going, the more kinetic energy. Of course, you'd also be wrong, because what you're taught to ignore in high school physics is the air resistance. And as that penny is falling, it will rather rapidly reach its terminal velocity, in which all the extra energy that's being input as it's falling down is, is going into heating up the air around it. That's the friction that it's pushing through the air with. And, and so now let's take this and make it extreme. Just as Jesse said, let's take everything to the extreme. Now we're gonna fall all the way down to the event horizon of a black hole. The amount of uh, energy that's released when you drop an object of some mass all from, from far away down to the event horizon is mc squared. That sounds familiar, that's Einstein's other famous equation, E equals mc squared, right? So that, that's a ridiculous amount of, of energy. So one gram, no, let's say 10 grams, you drop a, a paper clip, uh, and, and it's fallen mc squared down. That's what, that's that. Now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna do math in my head. 10 to the minus two times 10 to the 17 joules. It's uh, 10 to the 15, it, it, well, it's enough to power Toronto. So it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, how much energy gets released. But like the penny, it doesn't continue to accelerate. It bumps into everything else that's running down, and it gives that energy up into friction and heat, and then that produce, produces the enormous luminosities that we see. That's why black holes are the engines of the universe, because they're just so very compact and stuff that fall so very far. Right. Oh, one more. Oh, right at the back. I saw your hand first. Yep, uh, yep. Right behind you there. There you go. Oh, thank you. You're the last one. Oh, actually, a couple of questions. <laughs> I have a seven-part question. Uh, how many uh, um, black hole murders have been discovered by uh, the, the, the LIGO Virgo, roughly, today? I think it's somewhere of the order of five to ten. Okay. There was some, the number was in my last slide, actually, the number of murders. My second question, um, this is regarding one of the images that uh, uh, Dr. Sivanandram uh, 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 posted. It had the, uh, uh, the accretion disk, but also the jet that, that was imaged in both the radio and the uh, X-ray. Now, I noticed that, that the, uh, it was almost like, like the, uh, it was like a blue shroud, like the X-ray shroud in, inside the radio image of the X-ray. Was that, was, that like was that blue shroud caused by uh, like shockwave in the uh, in, in cell medium caused by the, uh, the jet? Yes, yeah, so that's actually quite close to what's happening. There's, there's gas around the galaxy and these jets are punching into and, and, and slowing down in the intergalactic medium and that's heating up the gas in that region. So that's, that's what actually generates the X-rays. Yeah, that's great. Oh, so I have to, sorry, was that the end? I was being, I was pulled back. <laughs> um, Please, everybody, let's thank our panelists for being so awesome. <laughs> we have one small uh, thing left. Um, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Ralph Chu to come up and, and close us out. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> well, this has been a, a very, very informative and entertaining afternoon. Uh, as they were, uh, as our speakers were commenting about the early observations and, and what they're uh, seeing nowadays, it cast me back to when I was an undergraduate astronomy student here at U of T 50 years ago. 
just as all of these observations were being made, and I, I uh, learned firsthand from the people who were making it. And one of the things that struck me about today's uh, discussions is that 50 years ago, we were looking at all these data, we were thinking about what could possibly cause all of these phenomena, and we had no clue. We really had no idea of what we were doing. And now, 50 years later, uh, it looks like we've got a pretty good idea, at least at a very basic level, of what is going on. And I do want to thank our speakers today for uh, uh, showing us uh, the progress that has been made and uh, making it so understandable, which is really, really important. So please join me again in thanking our speakers. For very